is Nana. I am the MC for today's session. Thank you for joining us on the workshop class of regional best stories on climate crisis today. Um, this session is a part of the journalism conference on reporting human rights and climate crisis in Southeast Asia. This event is a partnership of the Raoul Wallenberg Institute or the RWI along with Indonesian Association for Media Development, or PPMN, and Internews Earth Journalism Network, or EGN. This is our second session for the day. Earlier, we had a session titled Regional Challenges on Climate Change and Human Rights Coverage. And we have learned so much from the speakers. I also hope that you will also learn a lot from the session too. So I would like to inform you that we have interpretation feature in Bahasa Indonesia for the participants. You can just um, uh, check your Zoom uh, feature here and click the globe icon. And then we have also uh, a live stream in YouTube going on right now. You can go to YouTube and search PPMN. Uh, so now without further ado, um, I would like to introduce you to our moderator for the session. Uh, please welcome uh, Dewi Safitri. So, uh, by Dewi Safitri, she completed study in economics and development studies from Diponegoro University in Central Java, Indonesia, for a bachelor degree. And then she pursued her master's level, level at the University College London, studying science technology in society in 2015. And she currently serves as standards and practices specialist for CNN Indonesia. Her interests uh, includes media, science, and technology. To Mbak Dewi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Uh, welcome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the session. My name is Dewi, and, and I am both excited and privileged to moderate uh, this workshop on regional best stories on climate crisis. On behalf of the three organizations running the project, the Royal Wallenberg Institute, the Indonesian uh, Association for Media Development, and the Earth Journalism Network, I will be moderating this uh, session uh, as part of the Journalism Conference on Reporting Human Rights uh, and Climate Crisis for uh, Media Journalists in Southeast Asia. And with me today are two distinguished um, journalists from home and abroad, uh, Wahyu Diatnika, from Tempo Magazine Indonesia, and Ramesh Bushal, the South Asia Content Coordinator for Internews Earth Journalism Network. Uh, both uh, Blikomang and Ramesh have both worked extensively on the issue of environment and climate change and will share their experience and expertise of their best works on climate crisis in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, before we get to the speakers um, shortly, I would like to just remind you that the goal of the session are to share uh, one, their experiences in regional collaboration on environment and climate change, uh, in particular with regard uh, to the human rights, and second, the challenge of working in collaborative efforts in the region. And then lastly, the tips and techniques of successful collaboration and impactful stories. Um, we will get to the speakers right away. Um, each will get 15 minutes to 20 minutes top to present and afterwards it's the Q&A. Um, if we would like to post a question, please do so through the, the chat box. Um, there's a slight chance of a direct question time, uh, if, if time permitting. Uh, just uh, use the raise your hand feature uh, on the screen. Uh, and I will just operate on the first question, first answer basis for the Q&A. And um, so now we'll start with uh, Wahyu Diatmika, a highly seasoned uh, environmental journalist, probably one of the most decorated journalists in Indonesia at the moment. A long professional career in journalism since 2000. 
And in fact, I have seven pages of um, resume uh, of Lee Kong Hang at my hand right now. Just, but just to give you a glimpse of his, uh, his many uh, journalistic attainments, he started the career as a reporter in East Java and is now the CEO of the Tempo Digital. Um, he had had many trainings and courses in journalism, including one from the Neiman Fellowship at the Harvard University in 2015, while his Master's of Arts degree was from the Westminster University in London in 2005. He was previously known nationally to lead um, the global collaborative efforts on investigative projects, uh, such as the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. Uh, Wahyu, I'll leave the explainer on your presentation to you. And from now on to the next 15, 20 minutes, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much. Ba Dewi, for that very generous introduction. It is a privilege uh, to be in the panel with uh, Ramesh and other uh, distinguished panelists in other sessions. Um, I uh, think the best way to uh, learn the craft of journalism is by discussing stories. I believe that. So I suppose this uh, workshop is in line with uh, that tradition among, uh, uh, among us in this profession. So there is no uh, number one journalist because we all have editors and I was quite embarrassed by what, by how bad they will introduce me. But <laughs> uh, I hope uh, you all can learn uh, and of course, you are also invited to share your own experience. So uh, this session can be both uh, enriching and inspiring for, for all of us here uh, in these sessions. Um, I'm going to share my screen and um, share this story on the Pangolin reports. Uh, because I believe um, this uh, particular story is, uh, is a good entrance, is a good way to um, explain um, collaborative uh, cross-border project. It was uh, conducted uh, back in 2018. It started uh, in 2018 and, and it finished a year later. Um, in 2019. So it was a whole uh, year uh, project involving uh, more than 40 uh, reporters and editors um, across uh, more than a dozen countries uh, and, and newsrooms. Uh, and it was, uh, in my uh, understanding, it was the first um, Asian initiated uh, cross-border project um, and uh, it was uh, the beginning of what now uh, called the Environmental Reporting Collective or ERC. Now ERC uh, is led by my esteemed colleague uh, Ian Yi based in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia and uh, we has just uh, launch another project uh, this year on uh, ocean and uh, environmental uh, issues around uh, illegal fishing and around uh, uh, marine uh, life conservation in South uh, East Asia and uh, in Asia in general. So this is the overview. I'm going to talk about the project. How does it? Uh, how did it first happen, and how uh, it developed into a big regional uh, collaboration? And then uh, hopefully I can also, you know, insert some tips of, of you know how do we, uh, what we learn, what are the lessons learned from that experience. So this is the Pangolin reports. It's still. Uh, uh, out there uh, on the internet, you can just search uh, Pangolin Reports. 
Uh, we have uh, a special website dedicated for the whole reports. It consists of different angles. I can I will take you through the reports after this. It's quite it's quite a dense reports because it's it's basically uh, try to um, collect different angles from different uh, spots where the pangolin uh, first you know uh, sees and smuggle mostly into China. Uh, this is the, the context of the reports. Uh, we found this um, um, worrying trend since in the last maybe 10 or 15 years uh, that all pangolins from Asia and Africa were trafficked uh, illegally, mostly toward China, because in China, it was believed that the pangolin scale is uh, is a have a medicinal uh, benefit. It can cure uh, diseases. Uh, of course, it has no scientific uh, background, but a lot of people still believe it, and that's fuel this uh, illegal market for pangolins. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with pangolins, it's uh, it's the smallest mammal. It lives uh, in the forest, uh, mostly in Asia and Africa. Uh, and uh, because it's uh, it hunt ants, uh, it live on uh, small insects. Uh, in this forest, they uh, serve as a like a, a farmer, uh, so to say, in those uh, uh, in those uh, forest area. It 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 uh, uh, flip the 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 mud uh, the uh, the area, and it makes makes the area more fertile. So the loss of this particular species is really uh, a threat to the whole ecosystem because then the ecosystem lost one of its, uh, you know, uh, parts or its uh, element that, that serve a, a very significant uh, function in order to make the, the, the ground fertile every, uh, you know, now and then. So it started 2018 as a project, uh, uh, yeah, like only four media involved in the beginning. Uh, it started with, with that uh, particular uh, question, uh, how, did, how, how does this criminal syndicate work? Uh, what are the networks that involve in different countries in Asia and Africa and how can it slip through uh, so easily uh, you know, uh, across the border and get to its final market in uh, mainland China. And as you can see, uh, the price of pangolins also quite high, but quite very uh, depends on the countries. And this is all, all the countries that we uh, uh, in, that we uh, that we all come from in the network. Uh, it's uh, from China, Hong Kong, uh, also in Southeast Asia, all, you can, all, uh, all the countries in Southeast Asia uh, mostly are involved. And also uh, Nepal uh, in South Asia and Cameroon and get Nigeria in Africa. So this is the, one of the end uh, result uh, that we managed to map after the investigation uh, completed. We managed to see the network of um, smuggling that happened uh, in both continents. And we uh, have reporters on the ground uh, interviewing people, checking and verifying facts in each of these spots. So in Indonesia, we went to the forest on, on Borneo, in, in Borneo to, to see the smugglers who were arrested by the cops at the time. And then uh, from then from them, we got this uh, information on how they did it, how, what, us, what were the smuggling routes, how did they contact the other side and so on and so forth. So we managed to then end up with this, uh, with this uh, map to show the, the route, the smuggling route of violence. Um, so I, you about why pangolin it's uh so in the beginning i think this is really important for a collaborative story you need to find a story that really can connect you all connect us all everyone has to have a stake in the story everyone has to have 
a similar perception, a similar understanding of how important the story is for each of the members of the project. And uh, a good personal relation is also uh, quite helpful if you know your partner, your media partners, your counterparts uh, really well. That's a, that's a plus point. That's a very good point because then in a collaborative project, you need to have uh, the same level of trust, the same level of ethical standard. You have to have basically similar values in order to be involved in a cross-border project. You need to be uh, assured that your all of the members of that team have similar values. You you uh, follow same ethical values and so on. So that that's one big reason uh, to make sure a project can survive and deliver at the end is that the same level of trust and uh, values. And of course, other enabler factors should be available, uh, uh, resources, uh, funding, uh, and good timing, momentum for the story, uh, availability of resources and other. So that's that's the enabler factors. Still, you know, not that not high on the list, but with what without it, it can be you know more difficult to deliver. So this is how it begins. We this is the pangolin. It's a it's a very you know small mammal with uh, scales, but uh, it's actually a mammal. Uh, and they uh, they roll out if they get threatened, uh, and it's uh, it's really uh, you know near extinction because of the large scale trafficking happens. Uh, so we first invite. Uh, experts to join to help us we announced the project and then we met yeah, in hong kong uh, in early 2019 to get a brief from different uh, experts and also to map out our plan to create a timeline and a work plan. so it begins with this big meeting where we all share our ideas brainstorm um, the the story and try to imagine how the story will develop and what parts we can play uh, in each of the countries involved. So um, it is also important because the meeting enable us to meet uh, everyone involved in the beginning, but then it developed from there. Uh, the, the, the groups that you see in the picture then become larger because the story leads to countries that you know, uh, were not involved in the beginning. So when the story, for example, takes us to uh, Myanmar, for instance, because we found a smuggling route to China from Myanmar. So we need to find a partner in Myanmar. Uh, the same goes to, uh, you know, Thailand, for instance, because it's uh, a border, it has a border with, it's a border with China and Myanmar. Some of the traffickers also, uh, Lead, lead us there. Uh, some of the leads uh, we found in Thailand, so we need to find a partner there, so on and so forth. So it developed from this small group. Uh, then uh, we also, uh, you know, try to involve the public as, uh, as much as we can, engage them from early on because it's uh, we understand it's for, for environmental issues mostly. Uh, one of the big uh, challenges is right, to get people's attention, right? Uh, try to make them understand that this is important. So a lot of engagement on social media is important. And once the story published in each of our uh, publication, we also um, launch it and make sure people uh, understand and go for the story. So this is some of the findings. Uh, we, uh, as uh, you see the, the, in the earlier slides, the whole region maps. But well, this is the, the, the more specific maps into uh, different countries that uh, were featured in the study. Uh, from uh, Africa, and this is the, the route in Malaysia, our friends uh, in uh, Rage uh, in Kuala Lumpur uh, plays a very significant part to expose the uh, traffic, trafficking routes in Malaysia. Uh, this is the, the places, the spots in the coast area of Sumatra in Indonesia that we found to be uh, uh, the 
reverse, but for traffickers to get their uh, pangolin skills, or sometimes even uh, live pangolin smuggle into Malaysia. And from Malaysia, they use uh, land routes to get to China. Uh, in Philippines, we also found the same uh, cases. So uh, other than those experts, we also use uh, data heavily in this project. We uh, scrap a lot of uh, CACER data from custom offices across the countries involved. So from those data, we uh, try to map where the CACER happened. Uh, where usually custom office managed to expose the smuggle. And then from then, uh, from that data, we try to, uh, you know, uh, identify uh, hotspots where the most danger happen usually is the, the best or the preferred spot for the smugglers. So the a, a small tips when we try to do this, uh, uh, in order to, because the goal in this project is try to try, try to create a map to enable uh, us to uh, see the traffickers network and route. So we use people tracing uh, techniques a lot. Uh, we do that by trying to find initial uh, uh, whistleblowers or someone who can give us initial lead and using that person or uh, information as an opening and then snowballing from there. Uh, and we can also use social media also to uh, get initial tips. Uh, some smugglers try to sell their services on uh, on the dark web, on social media, uh, and then we map the network uh, in each of the uh, spots that we found. Uh, so at the end, uh, we try to also uh, get uh, real stories out of each step. So it's not end up only as a, a as a map or a network, but also get human stories, like face to face story from from the uh, uh, each parts in the networks. And uh, the human right uh, aspect of this story, I think, is really relevant because a lot of the uh, people who you know get uh, on the bottom and uh, as a victim of this trafficking uh, practice is the, the indig indigenous people. They, they are the ones who suffer uh, by losing this uh, species in the ecosystem. Uh, and also they often get blamed. Uh, Sometimes they, they hunt the pangolin for their own needs, for their own uh, use, but sometimes uh, the, uh, the public or even the law enforcement usually uh, use them as a scapegoat to, to, to blame uh, if these things happen. So I think uh, I almost run out of time. Um, let me just go to the last slide. Uh, this is just the, uh, the networks that we found. Uh, we use also data and document stressing tips. Uh, in the, in the project a lot. So as I said, we uh, scrap a lot of uh, seizure data and use that as a data set to uh, strengthen the story. Uh, and then we also use uh, many, money, money trail techniques uh, to see you know, the financial network behind uh, the uh, traffickers. So this is my last slide. Uh, what are the lessons learned? Um, we, when you start a cross-border collaborative project, uh, you never know how it, uh, where it leads you. So you need to be open-minded uh, about, you know, who the partners need to be uh, involved. Uh, in this particular project, we decided early on that it will it can evolve. So it's quite flexible about the partners involved, but it still needs a core team. Uh, the core team uh, is the one that, that hold things together, that make sure the projects run online uh, on time, because it's really easy to get carried away with different projects, and you have of course different uh, responsibility in your respective newsroom. So it, you you need to have a very strong core team to make sure uh, everybody deliver uh, on schedule. 
and on the tools, we use Google Docs to share stories, uh, documents, Slack and Zoom uh, for communications so nothing fancy. Uh, we use what we can. Uh, and I think the most important thing, thing is the trust that we have on each other. And that really carry the story until the end. Um, I guess that's all for now, Mbadegi. I hope that it can give uh, all of you some a quick, some idea of how the story uh, were developed, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, during the time. Thank you, Bli Koman. That was um, very interesting, but I also see um, it looks like a lot of work, complicated, a lot of work. And um, everyone, I would now um, invite you to enter the conversation. Um, anyone um, wanting to pose a question to Bli Koman, <clears throat> he's here to answer your question. Just post um, your question on the chat room or uh, use the raise your hand feature if, if available. Uh, oh, not yet. So yeah, um, put it on the chat room. But for now, uh, Bli, I, I have um, several questions. Um, to me, looking at your presentation, uh, I cannot uh, help but wonder um, if I am a newbie in the collaborative um, uh, transborder reporting. Um, uh, my position, uh, I live in, I work and live in Jakarta and I want to do a collaborative effort. Um, what would you say in terms of scale and complexity? What I mean by scale is, should I go easy first with, you know, probably just one or two uh, neighboring countries, a journalist in the neighboring countries, uh, Malaysia, for example, or or Thailand, um, several of uh, of the closest in proximity, just you know, to get it um, a little bit simpler in terms of um, working and assignment. And then, uh, when it comes to complexity, if when you decided upon um, having the pangolin as your center point for the collaborative reporting. Um, how how do you how did you decide on uh, how deep and how complex you want to go with the with the issue? Uh, do you want do you do you have a clear idea from the get go that um, what you want is uh, investigating uh, the illegal trade behind the pangolin or whatever comes you you will do whatever comes uh, with with the investigation? Um, I guess yeah. that's uh, two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madhavi. Um, uh, for the first one, uh, I think uh, as in any uh, project uh, or you know, any undertaking, I think it's best to start with the most simple ones. Uh, so things that uh, you, know, you, can, you can always develop from there. You can always uh, enlarge or evolve the project uh, once you have a very core uh, committed uh, teams or partners in the network. So if you want to start something cross-border uh, and you have potential partners that you know you can trust in you know, one or two countries, uh, go for it. I think it's best to you know, start small uh, as long as you can find you know, uh, an issue that, that equally important, equally significant for all the partners involved. Because that's really important. You, you don't want to end up, uh, you know, only you think the story is important and the others is just, you know, drag into it. So, uh, but I think I, I found that rarely happen because once you have this strong committed group, uh, sometimes you, you even think the, the same way. You think, you think the same, you have the same perception, the same, same values on issues and what, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, move people you feel passionate about. Um, on your on your second question, I think uh, uh, in my in in the Pangolin story project, uh, we uh, use uh, the three days that we have in Hong Kong uh, in the beginning of the project to decide on those uh, things that you mentioned. Uh, how deep should we go? Uh, what are the main angles? Um, how can we find an angle 
a storyline that can involve everyone because we don't want a story that only focus on the conservation for instance because mm -hmm. that will uh, give uh, an imbalanced portion to the countries that have pangolins like uh, Indonesia and Malaysia but not countries who are used as a trading route only like Myanmar or Thailand or countries that becomes the the market only like in China so by deciding uh, what are the story for us uh, what are the, the main story for each of us and then we floor it uh, we some of us who are editors can see the the link and the thread that can you know connect all the story together. So that's how we did it. Uh, we just uh, invite everyone to uh, to give their uh, ideas and uh, outline, and then from there we try to find things that can really connect the group uh, and the story into a big story that you know feels important for all of us. This this gets uh, really interesting, and um, uh, you don't get to see that many collaborative efforts when it comes to journalism across Southeast Asia. Um, um, yeah. Maybe I'm I'm just not seeing enough, or, or it's it's my own uh, limited um, journalistic vocabulary to scan for for any of this, but. Um, I come from um, an organization myself. I um, uh, am the current sitting uh, Secretary General of the Society of Indonesian Science Journalists. And when it comes to collaborative efforts, we always uh, thought that it's, it's, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard, it's going to, uh, it, it is going to um, cost a lot of money. Um, the coordinative uh, efforts alone will take you know, a lot of um, time and space and, and whatnot. And um, I think what, what you said about finding the trusted partner is one of the keys, but how do you find your trusted partner? When it comes to Pangolin Report, it involves so many people, so many newsrooms, how do you fit for which are which of the trusted partner and and how do you how do you communicate so they will join you on board uh, rather than you know this is not my story I want to do it alone etc. Yeah, it, that's a very good question. Um, I think for all of us, uh, the, the 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 Panama Papers was the the, the really open really eye openers uh, in terms of you know. Uh, you know, uh, making us understand um, the the impact we can create if we work together. So I think that's the first revelation, uh, and we have to thank our colleague at ACIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, to bring the project to to life and you know really taught us that important lesson. Uh, and uh, I think from that project, from Panama Papers, we realized uh, it is possible to work together. We are not lone, lone wolf, you know, so to say. You know, usually, investigative reporters are lone wolf. They work alone. They don't share anything. And then suddenly they get this big scoop and everyone, you know, are surprised. But uh, I think uh, we can create better impact. We can connect to larger audience if we work together because each of the media has different segments and different audience especially for environmental stories because uh, uh, environmental stories cannot stand alone uh, in one spot in one country because usually it involves supply chain it involves different players even if it's not we can learn from each other's experience in dealing with this particular case because most of the stories are similar. We have problems with uh, pollution, we have problems with uh, fossil fuels, we have problems with plastic, uh, deforestation, etc. So if we can just get the story together, we can give the public a better insight and a better perspective. So again, the question then is, you know, how do you find the right partners, the trusted partners? 
for the Pangolin project, uh, we rely on the, the networks that evolved from the uh, Uncovering Asia conferences that was organized by GIGN, the Global Investigative Journalist Network. They have this uh, B uh, annual conference that uh, invite almost every journalist in Asia. And the first idea of Pangolin come from the uh, Uncovering Asia conference in South Korea. Uh, on the sideline of that conference, we met uh, with uh, Professor Ying from Hong Kong, uh, uh, from Malaysia Kini, our friend from Malaysia Kini, our friend from uh, Rackler, our friend from the reporter in Taiwan. And you know, that's the beginning. Uh, In, in Myanmar, and I fed some of the uh, the media that later on involved. So personal con personal networks then help as long as you have this uh, core groups that have helped uh, in the beginning. Okay, thank you, Bli Komang, uh, indeed for the lengthy um, explainer. Um, everyone, just a reminder that uh, Blikomang is still available for any questions, uh, in particular about the issue of uh, collaborative efforts, collaborating uh, journalistic works um, in the region in Southeast Asia. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them on the chat room. Um, we'll have until um, 11.30 to finish the session. Uh, next, I will go to our uh, next presenter, uh, Blikomang, that will do for now. Thank you very much. Please stay uh, at your place uh, uh, if, if there's more uh, question next. Um, I would also just to remind you that uh, we are now um, uh, sitting at the workshop on regional best stories on climate crisis. Um, while Blikomang has um, explain at length about the side of the collaborative efforts in Southeast Asia. Next, we have Ramesh Bhushal. Um, he is the third Asia content coordinator at Internews um, Earth Journalism Network. Uh, he currently manages the Internews Earth Journalism Network, um, www.earthjournalism.net if you want to uh, have a look at uh, his work and uh, the network of the EJN uh, and the whole journalism activity in South Asia. He also works as the Nepal editor for the multilingual site, um, the third poll.net in South and Central Asia. Um, Ramesh has had a colorful journalistic career uh, from radio producer, radio host, to environment correspondent and science reporter, as well as editor. But um, I was so pleased to learn that both Ramesh and I actually have one thing in common, and that is that we both, at one point of our life, work for the BBC Language Service. Uh, uh, Ramesh worked for the uh, Nepali service, and I, of course, work for the Indonesian service. So yeah, high five, man. <laughs> um, he also traveled extensively for various environment uh, and climate change fellowship. Uh, but while his CV is modestly three pages only, uh, unlike uh, Blake Homer, who's seven, um, he actually have not one, but two master's degrees. I mean, how awesome is that? One is in environment science and the other in anthropology. Um, so uh, Ramesh Vishal, I'll leave the explainer or your presentation to you for the next um, uh, several minutes. Uh, the microphone is yours. Well, thank you, Davy. Um, it was nice to be here by you uh, about this collaborative um, journalism that we uh, often do and prioritize um, in Earth Journalism Network. Um, so um, I have been, you know, fortunately I do have two kind of things I do. I help journalists to build capacity to do better reporting 
and use my strength and capacity to help them wherever possible. We call them mentoring. And secondly, I also do stories for the third poll, which is um, one of the key partners of Earth Journals Network in South, East, South Asia. And uh, we do have the content coordinators, the coordinators in different regions. Um, so we exchange this information and stories um, you know, in different reasons too. So today I'll be talking more about one initiative we have been doing um, where I have been working um, you know, uh, constantly for over uh, a decade. Um, so, so I'll share my slide. Um, can you see my slide? Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. So I'm talking about um, reporting rivers and rights of people and the planet in Southern Southeast Asia. So we are talking a lot about our right on this planet, but have we given some space to the rights of other species or uh, rivers, for example, or the other entities that are helping us to live on, on this planet? So we so we we are talking a lot about ourselves, but when we talk about ourselves, are we not talking adequately about those resources that we are extracting or exploiting, right? So I'll be talking more about rivers because rivers link people, rivers link societies, and rivers link the countries. So I'll be talking specifically about few rivers that originate in South and Southeast Asia and save our lives. So this is what we call third pole. Uh, basically, how this third pole came in, uh, you know, this initiative came in was like the Earth Journalism Network and China Dialogue, that's a bilingual site. They wanted to discuss or bring the stories or the issues around water and the rivers in South Asia and Southeast Asia. So we, we tried to start a kind of initiative where we don't have the country boundaries and our geographical coverage is basically the boundaries of the river that originate in the Himalayas, um, you know, extending from Afghanistan to Myanmar, uh, covering around 3,500 kilometers of, of the tallest mountain in the world, including the Mount Everest and the Tibetan Plateau. So these are the, these are, this, is the, this is the third largest ice mass on the planet after North and South Pole. These mountains are the source of 10 largest rivers in Asia, including the Mekong in Southeast Asia, Yellow, Yangtze, Irrawaddy, um, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Indus. So you know, this is like a kind of a you know, network of the rivers. It is the headquarter of the rivers in Asia. Then we, we just you know, removed the national boundaries because national boundaries are so contested. They are so disputable. That's why we created a map of the river basins that originate uh, from the Himalayas. So if you see in the, on the left, you can see Amudarya, Tarim on the Central Asia and then move towards East. You come to Pakistan with Indus and you know, India all the Ganges in Nepal, India, Brahmaputra on the left and on the right uh, in Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, India. If you move towards uh, east, you can see Irrawaddy, Salween, and Mekong. And if you go up to north, you can see Yellow and Yangtze. So this picture, like it is a, such a different picture, right? We are so used to use the national boundaries. But if we start removing the national boundaries, we figure out how network we are. Uh, in, you know, if you take the example of rivers, that's where you know this re the reason looks like. Um, if we remove the national boundaries and try to understand how rivers shape our um, our, our livelihood, and um, you know they have been such a resourceful thing, a resource for the humans because we have exploited, we have used. Uh, the resources, you know, the rivers too much. If you see the, the global data, 
about 60% of the rivers globally have been dammed for different reasons and only for the consumption of the, of the humans. Just one species that is available, or I mean, that is just one, one species, you know, among millions on this planet, right? So we are exploiting rivers a lot. But rivers, you will, you know, reporting rivers means a lot because you can understand several aspects of life and the ecosystems um, that is supported by the rivers. Um, so the third poll is something we call alternative media because we have uh, we have a lot of ministry media, but we try to start up a kind of a, a very nice kind of a, kind of a initiative um, that has a focus on river and water crisis because um, you know water is going to be one of the most um, you know pressing issues due to climate change. It is already, but it is going to be a larger issue due to climate change. And also we bring in the journalists from different reasons, commission the stories, edit them and publish in multiple languages. And these stories are republished by several outlets, mainstream outlet in the region. Uh, we do a lot of collaborative pieces because, you know, oftentimes as a journalist, we are so bound with national, what do you call nationalism? Like even something is wrong, you don't, you don't dare to say this is our government's fault when it comes to nation. So we are much more bounded around our, our thoughts, our beliefs, our culture, and our, our nationality, or, or what you call the, the, the nation comes first, for example, right? So these kind of things don't allow you to go beyond your country and criticize uh, the things that your country is shaping around. So when you do a collaborative pieces in between countries, if journalists come up with the idea and then do a kind of collaborative piece, then you can give a whole picture of, of, the, of the problem and then you know, try to tell the realities and inform people or better inform people to make better decisions, not only people, but in the policymakers, including policymakers. So we do a lot of collaborative pieces you know, uh, uh, in, in the third poll. And also we have a site called Mekong Eye, Mekong. We have Equatorial in Indonesia. Uh, we have a uh, you know, content coordinator in the Philippines. So we exchange our, our idea and story and then try to tell what connects us when it comes to environment, right? And uh, we decided to do deep dive into water issues um, and you know, put our geographic uh, coverage as, as the river basin. So when it comes to reporting water and climate change, we, we focus on, on the river, but you know, river is all about water and climate change. And also it is all about you know, agriculture. It is about food. It is about you know, energy because you know, a lot of the rivers have been used uh, to generate electricity, you know, uh, through hydropowers. So uh, the climate change is impacting water significantly. It has already, well, both in availability of water and the pattern of rainfall is changing, which means our life, life will, sorry, life will, you know, you know, depend on on our rivers, and this is going to be impacted a lot. So how do we tell the stories? How do we tell the stories beyond? Develop one, like we say, we need to develop. Yes, it is. But how do we tell how we need to develop? How you know how we can be environment friendly? How do you understand all the dynamics of energy, food, and water? And um, you know, if you just go, we are talking about human rights and climate change here. So if uh, the water availability is you know impacted, it is going to uh, you know affect. Um, the individual's access to clean water, which is a purely a human rights, for example. It is going to affect the right of every individual to get food to it because the rainfall is changing, the pattern is changing. If we are not telling the stories in a better way, we are missing that part as well. So you know, reporting climate change is not just about the climate patterns or the warming, you know, warming temperature. It is all about how it will affect economy, how the poor and marginalized people will be affected, and how other ecosystems will not work well if this happens, right? So water is a very precious thing. 
Just 3% of water on this planet is fresh water. All the humans, all the, you know, I mean, we are fighting for 3% of water. And if this 3% of water is in peril due to climate change, it is really going to create conflict. It has already created conflict. You know, the countries are fighting for the rivers. The countries are fighting for water resources. And it is going to increase in the future. How do we tell the stories of this conflict and, and also link with how people will impact, you know, impact it? That is where we have been working a lot and reporting. Um, stressed planet will have insufficient water. It is sure. You know, not in volume, the volume may be okay, but the timing of the availability will be, will be changing. So that will create a lot of stress and it will be determining the future of almost all of us. So, but there is something called common, but differentiated impact. You know, the rich people may be impacted less and the, and the, and the poor will be more. The marginalized people will be impacted more or the indigenous people will be impacted more. So, you know, there will be stress Definitely yes, but the the level of stress is different. That's why that is a common problem. But there will be differentiated impacts. So how do we tell the story of differentiated impacts so that we'll be getting like we will be doing more. You know, we'll be creating you know better policies to to address those those issues. I was talking about this two billion people's life. That is being supported by about 10 largest river in Asia that originate in the Himalayas and save the lives of people in South and Southeast Asia. So 2 billion is almost one fourth of whole humanity. And uh, the best and meaningful stories of climate change comes around water and the rivers because they are saving our life. And we need to tell the stories in, in, in a more profound way. Um, rivers have lifelines, but the rivers are becoming lifeless. So lifeless, lifeless rivers are not worthy, right? So how do we make lifeful rivers and make our life resourceful, right? How do we talk about economy and ecology? How do we talk about this you know, balancing ecology and economy? Because the world is so dominated with all this economics, you know, economic perspective. But if we fail to understand how the nature works or tell the stories of environment, we are not going to be happy, right? And it is so polluted. Our rivers are so polluted. Our water bodies are so polluted. And it is too politicized. So how do we reduce this, both the politics and the pollution in the river? We need more stories to tell. We are not giving enough space to these water bodies that support our life. That is where we do a lot of stories. I focus on that. And also large population is dependent on the rivers or the fresh water. So if we don't tell the stories in a better way, we are missing a lot. We are not telling people good information. We are not good giving good information. And that is not helping people to make better decisions. And that will leave us into a trouble, right? So how, how we, we need to think about this. And I think as journalists, we need to think more seriously, do more collaborative pieces and understand whole dynamics of the, the, the environmental issues in, in the context of climate change. Um, I did a few uh, longer stories. In 2018, I traveled all the way from Tibet to India, walked for three weeks, wrapped for 10 days. So one and a half months you know, from Tibet to India in the remotest part of the world, in Tibet, in Nepal, and went to India along the longest river called the Karnali and did uh, a, a series of stories to understand how this river has been impacted, how the life has been impacted, and how the politics is working around in between India, China, and Nepal. In 2016, I traveled in a river called Kosi in the eastern Nepal from Tibet to India to do a lot of, I mean, to do a series of stories to figure out how things are, are moving, how you know the life has been impacted, how the geology has been impacted. So this kind of things. Uh, in 2019, we did a kind of a, a, a video story. Uh, in, in, in the shadow of Everest, Mount Everest, where people were sifting from villas to down the stream because there was no water. So we, we say like we have too much of water in Nepal, but we all do have too less of water because for four months we have too much of water because of monsoon. And for the eight months, we don't have enough water. So how are we balancing it? How do we understand this? So to understand that, I traveled uh, in different part of the 
of, of the Himalayas to report back and tell the stories. And we do a lot of stories. We commission the stories to people across the Himalayas, Southeast Asia and South Asia and Pablis. So we, we focus on something called water in larger perspective, but also we do a small uh, stories, very in-depth stories around the life supported by the, uh, by the rivers, the ecosystem supported by the rivers or, or the water systems. Um, this is what we do in South and Southeast Asia. So if you have any questions, please let me know. But I want to, you know, I want to stress that we need to think about the larger ecosystem rather than humans only. Otherwise, we'll be missing a lot of stories that needs to be told to people to make better decisions. If you want to reach out to me in Twitter, and there is a mess as well. If you want to reach out to email, there's my email. Thank you very much for your time. And I um, you know, would like to thank you um, for, for considering me for the presentation. There we go. Thanks, Ramesh. Um, that's a lot of um, rivers and waters uh, from Ramesh. Um, and, uh, and, and which is interesting because I've never thought of uh, rivers and waters that way when it comes to climate change. The intersectionality is simply a vast. Um, it, it's a connection to climate change, it's connection to conflict, it's connection to environment and pollution is connection to problem of access of clean water, to biodiversity along the rivers and the rivers back in, to food security, to energy, to poverty, to politics of waters and rivers. So many issues all blend together by the rivers and waters. Um, I have several other questions, but first um, from uh, the participant, we have um, Erti Fadila Putri, uh, Erti, sorry, Erti Fadila Putri, um, uh, not mentioning the media she uh, comes from. I want to ask about the Chinese dam project that is destroying the Mekong River ecosystem. Is the third poll also campaigning for the impact caused by the construction of this Chinese dam um, that will damage the Mekong River ecosystem? And secondly, how to form people power that is concerned with water security issues, especially know that, um, hang on, especially know that we are actually facing a clean water crisis. So that's the question. Oh, thank you. Um, definitely China is in the headwaters because the headwater of all the rivers are in China. If you talk about Mekong or Irrawaddy or uh, I know the Ganges or Brahmaputra, so the largest rivers originate from the Tibet, the plateau, uh, you know, um, on north of, of, of the Himalayas. So um, there is a large, you know, uh, you know, projects going on, but it is not only China that is, that is building um, the dams, but uh, I mean, it is a huge economy, but they have been, um, so they have been building the hydropowers in their region. And also, they have been supporting or constructing hydropowers um, in other countries in, in South and Southeast Asia. So it is, it is really a big issue uh, in the region. And uh, we need to talk about how do we balance between electricity and ecology? We need electricity, definitely, yes. But how much? How much we exploit the rivers? Because the rivers are a very sensitive ecosystems. And if we are so greedy and if we don't really think about the old ecosystems, it is not going to help in the future. We are expecting more extreme events. So if we're investing billions of dollars in hydropowers and our climate system is unstable, we don't know what will happen. The un uncertainty is increasing, which means our investments are in peril. So how do we tell these stories? How do we you know, balance this eco, you know, ecology and electricity is, is a very challenging question. And there is no level of cooperation in between countries because there is a huge economic interest and dra that drives a lot. That drives very much. People don't listen about all the things. But ultimately what we have to think about is if we don't treat our rivers well, they are going to treat the same way. We have seen it, the large floods, the landslides in the region. So the way we treat the rivers, they will, you know, they will reverse. They will, they will treat the 
the same way back. So it is important story. We are not telling this story in a better way because we are very much, you know, you know, you know what are you called? Um, we are very national, I mean, we are bounded with these national boundaries and we don't go beyond it. We need to talk about it. We need to talk about the real things and we need to, to come together. People are not agreeing to talk to each other because these are driven by the economic interest. So how do we, how do we bring them? And then I think if governments don't talk to each other, the civil society can talk a bit and journalists can talk more because we have said that we will, we will we are the ones who will go beyond national boundaries, we'll tell the truth. And by networking, like the collective reporting or the third poll or the Mekong Eye, we can, we can come together and then tell these stories in more profound way. For example, a Chinese journalist, a Vietnamese journalist, a South Asian journalist, or Nepali or Indonesian. I mean, and we can come together and tell the realities so that government understand and the people who are in downstream and upstream understand about the problem. I think that is the way we can deal with this, this problem. Otherwise, there is no way we can move ahead. All right, thank you. Um, Arti, Arti, I hope that answer your questions. Um, she actually commented, I agree how we deal with economic interest and ecological interest go hand in hand. Okay, um, Ranish, I, <clears throat> I noted a little bit about what you say about best and needful stories around uh, climate change comes from and around water and rivers. But most of the time, when it comes to rivers and waters, um, I'm, I'm not speaking about uh, the region, I'm speaking about uh, when it comes to Indonesia, the most um, covered issues on rivers and waters are its pollution. So uh, cover one of um, the many uh, intersectionalities that you have mentioned about uh, the issues around waters and rivers. So how do you push for other issues aside from pollution. It's almost like the only problem with rivers and waters in Indonesia is its pollution side, but the others are non-existent. So how do you push for that? Yeah, because it is easy to see pollution. You can see just in front of yourself. So you see that one as a bigger problem. It is a big problem because our rivers are becoming lifeless and they are, the, they are very sensitive ecosystems. And uh, and we are not treating them well. So pollution is, you know, is something people have been talking about a lot. And second issue that we are talking a lot about is the floods, for example, or the disasters that you know we call the human-made disasters. So these two things are quite seasonal and easy to easy to know or easy to see. But we are not going in depth to understand why this is happening, right? So all the side stories that we are talking about are the many stories. We are not doing better seaways. That's the reason for this, our filthy rivers. So how do we manage our, our sewer system is more important to talk about that than the, the, the pollution in the river. This is a part of it, right? And then the whole encroachment of the rivers uh, is, is something we have not been talking about because the river has its own territory. And if we start, you know, try, you know, encroaching them, they will come back because, you know, whole water set, we have to look at the water set. So the amount of water that falls into water set is definitely going to come and is sometimes less, sometimes more. So uh, we are trying to invade or, or encroach the territories of river. And when it comes, its way, we say that it is flawed, it is creating problem. But some way, I think we need to think about the side stories and many stories. How do we manage them is something, how do we manage our houses? How do we manage our waste? How do we think about rivers? And how do we not encross every piece of land available on this planet, right? So we need to, we need to get back. I mean, to, in a little bit, you know, rethink about how we think about Shaping. And also we are very arrogant species because we think that we are the you know, wise species. We are, you know, we are intelligent. We, are, we have like thousands of engineers around the world. We can build dams, we can build, you know, um, uh, what do you call bridges. 
So we have some kind of arrogancy in telling that, look, we are the humans, we can just do whatever we want and we can make ourselves safer, but it is not going to work. It hasn't worked well in the past few years. It is not going to work in the future because we are really, really into it. We are really in, in crossing the river. So I think we need to think about, I mean, we don't have to think about, I mean, we say like rivers are just the channels that flow flowing uh, around us. It is not, it is not actually. It is all about mountains. It is all about the hills. It is about the riverbanks. It is about the you know erosion. It is about seaways. So, you know, our whole system is built upon around the rivers and the oceans, right? So how do we link up that one is very important. And I, I think as journalists, we need to go beyond this, you know, uh, issues that we have been covering much and bring those side stories into the many stories. Right. Ramesh, thank you for that. Uh, and that is for our Ramesh presentation. I will now uh, re-invite Bli Komang or Yudhya Mika uh, to the Q&A session again. So everyone, uh, you're welcome to post any question to both of our speakers. Uh, Bli Komang has, um, stress, uh, has emphasized his presentation along the importance of uh, doing collaborative project, collaborative efforts when it comes to uh, journalistic efforts, uh, highlighting the climate change, climate crisis, uh, and its impact. While uh, Ramesh uh, has uh, stressed uh, a lot of his presentation on the importance of rivers and waters and how it brings to life uh, a lot of uh, intersectionality issues. Uh, with uh, people in different countries uh, and different borders. Um, I will now start with uh, Pli Um You've, you've had, had um, several uh, collaborative projects with um, many journalists uh, across Asia and probably across the world as well. Um, so, what is the, uh, what are the challenges to to do that? Um, w were there any moments in the project that you thought that uh, done? Why is this so difficult? Uh, how do you how do you get out of this, uh, etc.? Yeah, thank you, Madhavi, uh, for the question. I think uh, the difficulties really uh, uh, lies on the manager managing the project itself because uh, there's two types of collaborative project. Um, the one that uh, initiated by uh, uh, an association or uh, a, a group that really focus on uh, managing this uh, cross-border project like ICIJ for the Panama Papers and the last one is the, the Pandora Papers that was just released a few months ago. And uh, we have uh, other groups like that, OCCRP, for instance, um, also quite um, intensive in uh, initiating uh, and managing this project. Usually the, the, the management side of that kind of project is not really challenging because they have a dedicated person for that. But the second type of collaborative that uh, involve you know, different newsrooms, um, you know, without a core uh, teams, usually uh, uh, it's more challenging because uh, we start with, uh, you know, equal uh, say or equal share of responsibility in the project. Uh, and sometimes it's really uh, people quite reluctant to take lead in this kind of project. And, and that uh, could lead up to, you know, time uh, deadline not, mad uh, deliveries or assignments uh, not being done on time or not executed properly and so on and so forth. So uh, from my experience, the, the, the managing of the project is, uh, is one challenge that usually happen uh, despite of the trust and the similar uh, understanding or perception on the issue. Uh, sometimes the small things, you know, that, 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 could uh, be, a, be a, a stumbling block, so to say, in that 
kind of uh, collaborative project. Mm. Right. Uh, Ramesh, there, uh, we, uh, a lot of people who, who, who attended today um, represent um, the different newsroom and, and within the newsroom, there's only um, the, the specific spaces for issues when it comes to climate change or environment or climate crisis. Um, so when it comes to specific particular particular issues such as water and rivers, how do you convince uh, the editors? If, if I am the uh, reporter, the correspondent, how do you convince my editors that we need this story more than, I don't know, the story on the gig economy or the stories on another corruption? Um, uh, that this is not just a story on rivers, but that our audience really needs the story. Uh, that's a pretty tough um, thing to do as a reporter. Um, you know, um, oftentimes we think that environmental stories are the fillers, like when you don't have a positive story or a story, and then you just say, hey, no, hey, do you have one story that can go to the first page? And then you do a kind of a, you know, a 500 word piece for the first page, and you are happy because you know, your stories rarely come as the many stories. Um, but I think, you know, um, in, the, in the recent years, uh, the newsrooms I, I have been working with and, you know, collaborating, there is a kind of a sense of um, increasing understanding of the environmental crisis that we are going to. It is not just about the climate change, but I think the good part of climate change is that we knew a bit early that the planet is not going in the right direction. So this is the good part of the climate change, all right? People have started thinking about, are we doing something wrong? And then a lot of editors now started to say, say to me, like say, can you come to the newsroom and then give a kind of a presentation saying why this is important. And then they have started to come up saying, look, can I republish this story? Or can you help me uh, help our edit, I mean, the reporter to, get more inside of this, this problem. So I think um, the whole way is to, you know, delink climate change because we have said the earth is warming. It is two months. We have been saying a lot. Now we need to tell what happens if earth warms and what happens to frogs, for example, what happens to tigers, what happens to plants. So now we have to go into the specifics now. And these stories will come very interesting, right? If you start saying, uh, you know, talking about the frogs and the climate change, then people will be saying, oh, really? So, you no, know, let's, let's, you know, re reduce the whole global and this, you know, earth is warming news into specific news and, and make it interesting, right? And there are a lot of research being done. We need to just dig out a few things and talk to the, you know, the science people and, you know, keep our, you know, relation with them and, you know, engage ourselves a lot. We don't, uh, we, we don't have to do it much, right? And then that will certainly help you to get a space. But I think there are two things are happening. One is the science is emerging. Science is advancing. That's why we have more stories from science. And the newsrooms are getting more into, in, in, into environmental problems because the editor also knows that, you know, there's a flood. The editor has also started to know that the earth is in crisis now. Both way, I think we are a bit more privileged now to, to you know, get more space, but we have to push it. There is no way to uh, be one, right? So I think that is the only way we can, we can deal with it. Yeah. Can I jump in there, mm -hmm. Madhavi? Right. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I agree with our... Um, this is speaking from the... Yeah, yeah I, I think... Sorry, uh, uh, I was... I was just about to add a comment that this is speaking from uh, your point of view as the editor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Go ahead, my, uh, I, I agree with Ramesh. I think that climate change, climate crisis story is the most important story nowadays. Uh, and I think we need to uh, look at every story from the environmental point of view. Uh, political story, business stories, uh, city story can can also have environmental angle, 
And uh, so it's not just limited to environmental uh, stories because you know if we start to introduce that perspective to the newsroom, uh, all story can be uh, related to climate crisis. Uh, we talk about pollution, air pollution. Uh, it can be a city story. Uh, we talk about uh, the same topic, air pollution, link it to uh, energy. It can be a business story. So my point is, uh, to make it more interesting and to make it more uh, convincing to the editors, uh, you need to relate it to a you know uh, a stake that can be relatable to the larger audience and can be anything. It can be a business. It can be politics. It can be you know lifestyle. Uh, so it doesn't need to be just about the environment because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's streamlining it into our everyday reporting is the challenge, and I think that needs to be done because, uh, as but then we uh, imply in the question, it's still very difficult to convince editors uh, to see the importance of the story. But if you you know widen the angle and re relate it to uh, everyday life and localize it, give it a human face. Then it's more. I think it's more difficult to refuse that kind of story. Okay, so climate change, but make it local. Uh, yeah, and make it relevant. Thank you, Blikomang. Uh, thank you, Ramesh. Uh, we have another question. Oh, but, but just before that, um, ladies and gentlemen, everyone. Uh, the session is uh, the workshop on regional death stories on climate crisis. What we want to do is uh, give you a highlight of how collaborative uh, efforts can be done when it comes to uh, highlighting the problem of climate change, climate crisis, and uh, the human rights and its other intersectionalities, and also the tips and techniques of successful, collabor successful collaborative efforts and making um, stories with impact. Uh, we have uh, less than 15 minutes now. But uh, please do keep your question coming. Uh, one is already here. It's from Rizka Rizlia. My name is Rizka. My question is, as a journalist, how we deal with controversial environmental issues and how to make a qualified report since some of the issues has relation with certain people's interests. Sometimes it leads to an enormous risk. And by enormous risk, uh, she, mean, she meant by uh, the, the security of the reporters. So it, it involved a lot, uh, a lot of interest of a lot of parties and that just may harm um, the reporters uh, 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 himself or herself. Uh, Blikomang, would you like to start on this and then I'll go to Ramesh. Yes. Um, it is quite dangerous sometimes if, if you plan to investigate an environmental uh, story that has a uh, connection to maybe corporations or a uh, group of people who commit uh, legal uh, logging or you know environmental uh, um, you know committed a crime in, in environmental uh, aspect of their uh, business or operation uh, you can cross uh, their, uh, you know, uh, interest in, uh, in, in running those illegal businesses. Uh, I think uh, how to minimize that uh, risk, uh, in my opinion, it's always goes back to good, you know, basic, uh, good quality journalism, good quality reporting. Uh, if you uh, done your homework, uh, uh, verify each evidence, confirming uh, stories to relevant parties, and especially give the accused uh, a space to also give their side of the story. Uh, I think usually that basic steps um, help you minimize the risk because you uh, have all the evidence and you also don't uh, try to, you know, uh, just, just give one side of the story, but also you know be be, be open for you know uh, the accused version of what happened. But if that still lead you to some problems or some legal risk, uh, I'm coming back to my point about doing it together as a collaborative project. Uh -huh. Usually, that 
not only optimize the impact, but can also minimize the risk because if, if, it, if it become uh, a, a large project where not only one newsroom published the story, then uh, usually it, it, it's, it, it looks stronger uh, and it's, uh, it's, it can be a deterrent for anyone who try to try to, to harm the reporters or try to you know, challenge the, the accuracy of the reports. Right, stronger together. That's one of the, the key points. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ramesh, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I think you know, journalism is a risky business already. So we know that. And we decided to be a journalist because it is risky. We knew it or, you know, from the day one that we want to be a journalist. But I think protecting ourselves is very important because you know, the, it, is going to, it is going to be more riskier because uh, you know, more extraction of resources, a lot of illegal things are happening. So, you know, and uh, we have seen a lot of journalists being killed in different parts of the world because all this natural resources politics is, you know, is escalating, right? It is really, really moving, uh, moving up. So it is very important to understand how we make ourselves safe. Um, and uh, we need to, I think one way to avoid or reduce the risk is, you know, uh, you know cooperate with, I mean, collaborate with others. Um, and also, uh, you know, collaborate with the lawyers, for example, uh, collaborate with the experts, scientists, activists, so, you know, don't, don't just, you know, keep yourself as kind of, a, you know, within yourself, but, you know, try to make a cohort where if something happens to you, there is a, is a group or the society that will talk, you know, you know uh, for you or help you wherever needed, right? So that is one way to make sure that you are linked up with all these global regional networks that value and, you know, act as a civil society, and that they will you know, come to help you when, when, you know, so when, when they need it. The second is um, try to reduce the individual threat, the physical threat by, by you know, taking some safety uh, you know, journalism trainings uh, you know, or digital safety journalism trainings and, and make yourself safe. Um, you know, that will help you to reduce the risk. And the third is also talk with the editorial team and the editor beforehand uh, about the story that you are going to do and the associated risk. That's, you know, and then if something happens to you, there is your editor to, you know, to take care of you, you know, you know, somewhere needed, right? So I think, you know, we need to be cautious. We need to understand the dynamics, uh, but we have to, and also what the fourth thing is, we have to be correct. We should be reporting correctly uh, so that we don't fall in the trap. If we manage this one, I think we'll reduce the risk, but we should bear in mind that journalism is a risky business and it is going to be more risky in the future. Right. Very strong message to Ramesh. Thank you very much. Indeed. Um, so we have less than seven minutes and I want to use um, this uh, last several minutes to uh, ask you both, uh, Likomang and Ramesh, uh, the question that I've always had uh, with regard to those who had um, or lead the, the, the newsroom. To some extent, both of you are, are head of the newsroom. And I uh, wonder, how do you see the coverage of um, climate change, climate crisis, and the intersexualities uh, to both issues when it reported um, as um, the uh, media, the mainstream media, at least, uh, both in uh, the region and in Indonesia. Likomang, which you, which you start with how, how it's being reported in, in, in Indonesia? Yeah, I think uh, in the last few years, we have seen a growing uh, space, uh, a growing portion of uh, climate crisis reporting in our national media. Uh, I think uh, the newsroom awareness of its importance has uh, has grown in, uh, in a positive sense. Uh, and uh, I think the, the, the resources available for those kind of reporting also help uh, moving uh, the media landscape into that direction because now there's 
a lot of uh, opportunities, a lot of collaborative uh, offer, uh, you know, uh, on regional and global uh, scale that can, uh, you know, really uh, make it possible for this kind of reporting. So maybe uh, a few years ago, uh, if there is a reporter with this idea of reporting climate crisis, maybe they don't have any support from within the newsroom, but now it is becoming possible because of the, the various resources available. Uh, so I think first the awareness, the, the awareness have uh, certainly increased. And second, the resources available also help make it happen. And uh, hence the, 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 the growth in, uh, in the scale and size of reporting on environmental uh, issues. But I have to say that not all of the uh, coverage have uh, the right perspective. Sometimes you still uh, see reports that uh, that put uh, environmental uh, issues in conflict with economic uh, issues, development, uh, human uh, needs, and etc. Uh, while you know, what we need is, you know, uh, a more holistic view that uh, without environment. Uh, all others will be uh, lost. So this is not something that you need to choose. This is something paramount. That kind of perspective, I still still think needs to uh, needs to uh, brainstorm and discuss uh, within newsroom. So we all have the same perspective in seeing this issue. Right. Uh, very important point for the uh, PPNM and Earth Journalism Network and the Royal Wallenberg Institute that your work is far from done. Uh, okay, Ramesh, go to you. Uh, with, with regards to uh, the perspective of the media in the region, uh, how uh, the, uh, the climate change and climate crisis has been uh, covered so far. I think and I agree with um, what here about increasing um, you know, space for uh, in, in media, but there are two reasons for it because there are so many online platforms that are available now and you don't have to worry about space when you have, when you talk about, um, you know, uh, stories in, on online. So that is a kind of benefit now, but newspapers are still struggling to <clears throat> balance this one. But I think with the online platforms, you know, it has uh, liberated all these newsroom space kind of thing a lot. Uh, but the more important question is how capable journalists are to understand climate change. Uh, are we helping to build capacity? Are we helping ourselves to build capacity? Because we need different angles. We need to understand the whole complex science. We need to understand the dynamics. We need to understand the ecosystems, ecology. So there is, uh, there is I think the demand side is increasing, but the supply side is not increasing uh, uh, in a way it's suited, right? So how do we nurture our reporters to bring in better stories? How do we help them to you know, build their capacities? How do we you know, tell them or help them to, uh, to understand how to work with data? How to understand, how to tell them, how to tell the probabilities or, you know, all, all these, you know, uncertainties that science has within the research, right? So we are not, I mean, investing resources to help build capacity of journalists. I think we need to fill in that gap. We are trying to do a bit, I know, as, as a niche media or a supporting agency like the Earth Journalism Network, we do a lot of trainings and kind of thing. But within the newsroom, I think there is a very negligible amount of resources available for individuals capacity building. If we don't do it, we will not be able to get the real stories, the better stories, the impactful stories. I think we need to also understand that and help to bridge that gap and also uh, try to bring in more enthusiastic and capable environment reporters uh, into the newsroom to make it more impactful and also uh, you know, to do better reports. I think that is also we need to think about. Oh. Very well said and fantastic, Ramesh. Thank you very much um, indeed. Thank you, Lee. Uh, uh, and also the participant, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for, for uh, the message from the chat room. Don't forget to fill the feedback form 
by clicking the available link if you want to get an uh, A certificate, but your feedback is uh, 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 valuable for um, uh, the betterment of uh, this uh, similar project uh, in the future. Uh, thank you for both uh, esteemed speakers, Ramesh Vishal, uh, Wang Yu Mika. Uh, so very pleased to have this opportunity to moderate the session and also to learn from both of you. Thank you everyone uh, attending uh, for your question and uh, for your attention. Um, for everyone uh, uh, making the time to participate, um, uh, last but not least, to Pepe and Ambra Wallenberg Institute and the Earth Journalism Network. So um, that's for this workshop today. Uh, hopeful to see you again at some other point uh, to campaign for uh, better coverage of climate change and climate crisis. Uh, my name is Dave uh, uh, Thank you again for having me today. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Nana, over to you. Okay, yes, thank you um, to Devi Savitri, Ramesh Puchal, and Wahyu Diyatmika for such an insight, insightful session. And thank you all for the participants who have joined from wherever you are in this world. But before we end our session, uh, let's take a quick picture first. Um, you can turn on your camera if you want, and I'll have my colleague from PPMN to take the picture uh mbak lina can you say can you please take the picture okay yes okay one open camera okay this is one of those indonesia's kearifan local <laughs> <laughs> yes this is our local wisdom okay then um Again, for the participants in the chat box, please find the feedback form. We highly appreciate it if you can fill it and you can uh, give a confirmation if you would like us to issue an e-certificate for you. Uh, and don't forget that we still have more sessions for tomorrow. So if you want to join them, please register from the link via the in the chat box. So see you again. Goodbye and see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. For human rights to be achieved, all parties must be engaged, aware,